Can you hear me okay? All right, I think we're gonna get started. Um, I was asked to chair this session and I have no idea what I'm doing, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, this is a panel on um, political ecology of conservation. And so we'll have four talks. Um, everyone will have approximately 15 minutes. Uh, Karis Enns, who's in the second row here, will be keeping time for us. So if you are a presenter, pay attention. She'll give us a five minute warning and then a stop. Five minute warning at 10 minutes into the talk and then a stop at 15 minutes. Um, we're gonna go in a slightly different order than what's listed in the program. Um, I'm gonna start first, and I'm gonna have the presenters come up and introduce themselves before they give their talks um, for the sake of moving things forward. Okay, so um, I'll begin the series of talks. I'm Libby Lundstrom, I'm at Boise State University, um, and I'm going to pre be presenting on a very, very new project. Um, it's definitely in the concept phase of things, and because of that, I am absolutely interested in your feedback and what you are thinking and whether this works or whether it flops. Um, really important kind of time to get feedback on that. So um, political ecology of jurisdiction. And basically what I'm gonna be arguing for is a political ecology of jurisdiction. Um, and I think some of the comments in the earlier panel about law um, really speak to this, that we need to be paying more attention to law and not just law, but the spaces of law, the spaces in which uh, law comes into being and how law brings spaces into being. So to start this, I wanna start with a recent time, um, New York Times article. Um, it'll be very American focused, but we'll move into some global examples a bit later. So the New York Times asked this question, are butterflies wildlife? And the answer is, interestingly enough, is well, it depends on where you live. And so the article goes on to explain that insects often have legal protection as wildlife in most states in the United States, with the exception of the states that you see in red here uh, in the lower image. And that's significant, obviously, because um, insects are declining at alarming rates, and even from a very kind of self-centered anthropocentric perspective, we need insects to survive as pollinators. So we're talking about um, a question that's really momentous from an ecological perspective, but it's also in relation, I think, um, important and momentous from a legal perspective. And so what um, my colleague Liz Elizabeth Havis at the University of North Carolina uh, and I are trying to do is to think through what a political ecology of jurisdiction would look like and really why it's important to make a case for it. And it's not just important for insects, it's also important uh, for bison, um, I'll talk about, about these examples later, and also for, so we're talking about terrestrial animals uh, like bison, but also for aquatic animals like tuna, tuna moving through the oceans, and to thinking about like how is jurisdiction important to the protection of these animals and to the legal de designation of these animals, and how that legal designation changes as they move through space. Um, and so I'll kind of start out by talking about the relevant literatures, uh, getting into some concepts, and then moving into some examples to ground some of this. Okay, so literatures um, beginning with legal geography. Le legal geography um, is a really important literature that examines how space and law co-constitute one another. Um, and it's here where we found the most explicit engagement with the concept of jurisdiction, although it's really scanty. Like we were kind of shocked by how scanty the treatment of jurisdiction is, even in the legal geographies literature. Um, and then we're trying to bring that together with political ecology and political geography, where there's almost no discussion of jurisdiction. Um, and that was a little less surprising to us than the legal geography and its sort of lack of engagement. And thinking through concepts, uh, the sort of core concepts of political ecology and political geography, territory, sovereignty, borders, and scale, and what we think, could be wrong here again, but what we think is that jurisdiction offers us something new, and it doesn't replace these concepts by any stretch of the imagination, but it refocuses us a little bit. And so jurisdiction becomes a really important complement to thinking through these concepts. And to just give you a few examples, when we think about territory, territory is like this big concept. It often refers to the space of the nation state. And in some sense, it like lumps things together. Whereas jurisdiction allows for more fine-grained spatial analysis. Um, it allows for bigger spatial analysis in the nation state, nation state, but it also very much allows this finer-grained um, analysis. Um, sovereignty, really relevant here as well, but sovereignty is more about the who of governance. 
Um, and we're interested first and foremost about the where of governance, um, but you'll see how these are related um, as we kind of move on. So, um, and I'll talk a bit more about these other concepts as we move on. Okay, so from a pedagogical perspective, this is a horrible slide. <laughs> Way too much information, but it's actually a really useful slide because this is the slide where we went through the literature and we're like, you know, what the hell is jurisdiction? Like, we talk about it as if we know what it is, but we didn't, seasoned political ecologists and political geographers, we didn't even really know what it was. And so we really slowed down to ask, like, what is jurisdiction? And so I want to walk through some of these definitions because they're really um, important, and I think they'll set the stage for what I talk about in a second. Um, first of all, the one thing I did want to note um, is that uh, one definition of jurisdiction is the right to try cases, like appellate jurisdiction, and it's not totally unrelated to what we're talking about, but we're interested in more in the literature what's either called territorial jurisdiction or just jurisdiction. And so Richard Ford, in a really important essay, um, defines jurisdiction as the rig rigidly mapped territories within which formally defined legal powers um, are exercised by formal, organized government institutions. And it's, it's a really useful definition because I think he's capturing a lot in very uh, short definition. And what he argues is that jurisdiction here works in conjunction with, uh, within and across the nation state, across territory. So it's not an opposition. It's very much territory is constituted through jurisdictions. You can think of it in those terms. Um, one of the best articles, if you want to read about jurisdiction, is this one by Valverde, where she argues the jurisdiction is a spatial unit and technique of governance. It sorts and orders, and this is absolutely key. I don't think territory sorts and orders, at least not in the same way. Jurisdiction sorts and orders. It parses space um, into, into units, and those units work in conjunction with one another. And so she argues that jurisdiction sorts in this order, where, who, what, and how of governance in a chain of events. And so you start with the where. So from a geographer, I was super excited about this. I was like, yes, <laughs> the where is really important. Once you answer the where, you can begin to answer this other series of questions in this order. And so Blomley also adds here, and you'll notice that these, these, uh, these resources are quite old. And it kind of tells us, like, no one's really writing on jurisdiction in a contemporary. So that's kind of what we want to do is get jurisdiction back on uh, the slate of things we talk about. So Blomley at, says the jurisdiction asks questions. And its main question is, which law is authoritative? Who speaks the law here? So some important points here, the here. Who speaks the law here in this space? Not in general, but the here. And the other part of this that I think is important is who speaks the law. The roots of the word jurisdiction are um, juris, law, diction, speak. Jurisdiction literally means to speak the law. And it has two moments. There's the original utterance of speaking the law. That's like the moment of, a, of constituting sovereignty. But there's also the what is spoken after the law is constituted. And so jurisdiction captures both of those really important moments. Um, also, we're interested in the ways in which jurisdiction, primarily a legal concept, but not exclusively. Um, and so our definition of jurisdiction is the space of legal power, the legal power to make certain decisions over a defined space or to, to define certain spaces of legal power. And so this is kind of what we're working through. So let's get to some real world examples. Um, before we do that, I want to talk about different types of jurisdiction. So we've got jurisdiction of nation states, where like South Africa would be a jurisdiction, the United States would be a jurisdiction, um, but so would supranational unions like SADC, NAFTA, the EU, those are jurisdictions. Um, you've got, this is an example I might have time to talk about, but regional fisheries management organizations, that's what this map is getting at. Um, and then this map here is public lands of the US West, and this gets us into the subnational jurisdictions, where you've got states, counties, private property, forest land, national parks. Then you also have tribal nations um, as independent sovereign entities. And to, so to think about not just jurisdiction at a national level, but really importantly, what's going on at these smaller scales of, um, of governance, basically. And then jurisdiction, what we've been trying to work through, acts in two spatial ways in a nested fashion, where you've got like the municipality and uh, city of Durban jurisdiction 
in KwaZulu-Natal jurisdiction, in South Africa jurisdiction, in SADC jurisdiction. So like this nesting relationship. Um, but we also, and the literature gets at this a little bit, um, the nesting part, but what it doesn't get at is what we call adjacency. Uh, and the ways in which different jurisdictions are next to one another, that really matters. Um, and one of the examples I'll talk about in a second Actually, you can't see it from here. But the ways in which national parks, um, conservation areas, can be adjacent against national forests, against tribal lands, um, which in some sense facilitates conservation, but it can also be adjacent against private property, which oftentimes um, stands in the way of, of conservation measures. And so to think about adjacency, these sort of classic geographical questions of like, why does it matter that this space is next to this space? What are the dynamics? Okay, I only have five minutes left, <laughs> so I'll go quickly. Um, and so we ask these questions about in what ways is jurisdiction a political ecology relation, questions about how non-humans are shaped and are shaping jurisdictions, um, how do jurisdictions give rise to the category of being in one space, an animal might be wildlife. As it moves to another jurisdiction, it might become a natural resource. So those sort of like changing of legal des uh, designations, how all of this is infused with power. And then what else? Like I'm curious what you all have to say. By the way, we're gonna save questions until the end with all the panelists. Okay, so a few examples. Um, I won't have time to walk through all of these, um, but one is the project I'm working now with the Blackfoot Confederacy up in Blackfoot Territory in Northern Montana, um, across the border into Canada. And it's a really interesting example because the Blackfoot are releasing buffalo into Blackfoot lands um, adjacent to Glacier National Park. Those buffalo will go into Glacier, decolonize Glacier to some extent, as tribal buffaloes move into a park where buffalo have been extirpated uh, by colonial process. Um, and then move on into Canada, into a national park up there. It's an interesting case because if we just look about questions of territory and sovereignty, we would say that Glacier National Park, this is the sovereign nation of the United States, uh, whereas in the purple, this is the Blackfoot, uh, Blackfeet Reservation, sovereign territory of the Blackfeet. But that doesn't get at the interesting spatial dynamics or doesn't exhaust them. What's, because this is like a very smooth relationship. These guys are buddies. Like they like each other. Glacier's super excited to have Buffalo back. Um, and it works in Glacier's favor to have this be tribal led. The resistance comes on the other side through primarily ranching lands, private property in the United States and Canada. And so we think it's jurisdiction that gets at this. Another important example is Yellowstone, which we all know about. Yellowstone down here in Wyoming. Um, buffalo are protected in Wyoming uh, as wildlife, but as they move outside, they're subject to hunting um, and they lose their le legal designation. But Legally, um, the tribes have challenged what's going on with hunting, and now tribes have been able to reassert their hunting rights um, outside of the park. To, so, and it's really these legal jurisdictions in which all of this legal wrangling unfolds. Uh, rhinos I'm not gonna talk about, but I think there's interesting jurisdiction questions across the Mozambique and South African border. Um, tuna, so this is, I work on terrestrial wildlife, Elizabeth works on uh, aquatic, and we think there's interesting questions here about tuna protection. And what you see here, these are all small island states in their uh, exclusive economic zones. Um, and then you've, so turtles have certain protections which it, within each EEZ. Um, you've got um, larger, um, sort of a larger set of relations going on here. And then you've got the tuna management, um, RFMO, going on here. And what's interesting about these cases is it shows jurisdictions unfolding as we speak because these are all really new jurisdictions. And they're not super comfy with each other. There's a lot of conflict. And so in some sense they're nested, but they're not nested in a comfortable way. So to think about the tensions across those jurisdictions are really important. Um, and then turtles is an interesting example. This is the IUCN red list map, uh, the general map, and then if you zoom in, you see um, a more, uh, much more kind of sophisticated uh, way in which uh, ocean space is um, defined by different levels of ecological concern. And we don't know if this is a jurisdiction or not. I mean, in some sense, legally it's not, because it's not state mandated, this is IUCN. But it raises an important question about spheres of influence. Um, how do spheres of influence impact jurisdictions? Or 
do we want to say this is also a jurisdiction? Even though it doesn't exist within kind of the Westphalian nation state um, legal apparatus, um, it still impacts, There's quite, it impacts environmental governance, so impacts the ways in which animals um, can move through space, the protections they're afforded, and so forth. Um, so I just have a minute left, so I want to wrap up. Um, one of the things I was thinking about in the earlier panel uh, about jurisdiction is that jurisdiction is really about terrains of legal struggle. Even if we don't see it, I think underlying jurisdiction is about terrains of legal struggle. And these examples are often about legal strug struggle of the protection of wildlife, but also the reassertion of sovereignty, I think, when we're looking at like tribal rights around uh, wildlife. And so to think about the trains of legal struggle, the terrains of legal struggle, like these are the spaces of legal struggle, and they're spatially, they're both spatially contained, um, but they're not entirely spatially contained. And if we look at like the question of adjacency uh, and the ways in which spaces nearby influence jurisdiction, I think it's really important. Um, so what we're trying to do here um, is to make a case for a political ecology of jurisdiction uh, and answer questions about how does jurisdiction matter to political ecology. I think it very much does matter. Um, how does it inter intersect and enrich core political ecology concepts? Looking at these different vertical, horizontal, and overlapping dimensions, um, looking across terrestrial and aquatic spaces, questions around legal pluralisms where you've got overlapping legal regimes. Um, and I just maybe selfishly want everybody to be thinking about jurisdiction um, because I think when you reorient your mind around that, it begin, you begin to ask really interesting questions about the way that space is um, carved up and the legal designations that come to rule those and give meaning to those spaces, um, and at the end of the day, why they really matter from a political ecological perspective. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. And next we have Dan Brockington. Okay, folks. Thank you ever so much for coming to this session. And um, I understand that it's generally possible to have three really interesting and good ideas in your head at the same time. Um, so we've heard one of them, which is the political ecology of jurisdiction. Thank you, Libby. You've got your own brilliant research ideas, which I'm looking forward to hearing. And so the third idea that I'd like you to keep in your head is that of data justice, which, like Libby's project, is a new one. And so I'm welcoming all, all, all feedback on it. Um, it does mean, however, but by the time I've finished this presentation, there will be no room for any new ideas. So apologies to all the people who are coming after us. Um, what I want to do in, in this talk is, is introduce something which I'm, is also just beginning. And there's a, a really group of interesting scholars, Jenny Goldstein, Eric Nost, Rose Pritchard, Laura Sauls, um, and Lords Vera, amongst others, who are thinking about this. And I think it has tremendous importance for uh, conservation, as I'm about to, to outline. But briefly, um, data justice is, um, re refers to the problems and issues that arise when large data, big data sets, um, increasingly govern our lives. And there are many examples of this. I'm just going to give you a, a couple um, put together from a fantastic uh, site that Laura Densick in Cardiff has put together. Um, she gives the example um, of the problems of criminalization, whereby a private company in the US um, has a, an algorithm which predicts how likely existing felons are to reoffend if they are to be released. And this has Im important consequences for their lives, obviously, because if you're likely to reoffend, then you're not likely to be released. But the company's algorithm isn't perfect, and it is imperfect in racialized ways. Black felons are more likely to be, to be predicted to reoffend, and that is more, prediction is more likely to be wrong. White felons are likely less likely to be predicted to, be, to reoffend. The private company owns this algorithm; it doesn't have public scrutiny. Yet these data have profound implications for the, the lives of prisoners in the U.S. Or take uh, Facebook. Um, which set up an algorithm which um, deleted people's names which it didn't think were real. So if you're Kim Tallbear um, and have a name which the Facebook algorithm rejected and many Native um, uh, um, American groups in the North American and, and First Nation peoples have experienced this problem, your, your name is, is erased from Facebook because of the algorithms which govern um, the way in which data are used. So it's large data 
which are um, collected through social media, through the uh, uh, use of phones, um, which are then subject to algorithmic analysis, which um, in introduces and reinforces bias which is present in society already. Um, now, you will notice, I suspect, the overlap between data justice and epistemic justice. And Miranda Frick draws upon um, two areas of epistemic justice, what she calls testimonial injustice and hermeneutic injustice. And these refer to, respectively, the inability of your um, knowledge as a knower, um, as somebody who knows something, to be recognized and, under, and, and, and credited as being true. And she also refers to hermeneutic injustice, which is the injustice a group of people experience when a collective experience that they have cannot be articulated or cannot be recognized as existing. And the example she draws, draws upon there is of um, sexual harassment. Before the term sexual harassment was invented, what do you call it? What is the name for that thing that so many people are experiencing? And being unable to name it makes it incredibly difficult to, to, um, to challenge and fight against that, that form of injustice. There is, it is interesting to me that there's a lot of work on data justice, which reflects our ability to, to, to ha have our, ex our own experiences recognized and taken, um, taken credence of. And the, the, the work on epistemic just, injustice, which has distinct overlap, and, and yet that overlap is not commented upon as very much as I can see in the literature. There is um, Liz Anderson's work, and I was drawn to Liz Anderson's work by some, uh, uh, somebody working on data justice called Lynette Taylor. Um, and she points, Liz Anderson has pointed out that in Miranda Fricker's work, there is a tendency to focus on, on epi epistemic virtue by individuals and the, the duty of people to um, address uh, epistemic biases themselves. But, but, but there are some forms of systemic epi epistemic injustice which it's difficult to do much about as individuals. And this, is, this I think, is where, where data justice comes in. And just to illustrate, I think it's important that we turn to children's literature. Um, some of you may remember uh, this book, My Side of the Mountain. If you come from North America, I think Libby, you may be the only person in the room who's heard of this. You know of it too, okay. About a, a, a kid from New York who goes into the Catskills Mountains um, and lives off the land. He um, takes a peregrine falcon and, and hunts rabbits. He, he, he fishes trout from the streams. He um, traps deer. He poaches. That boy is a poacher. And this book is a, an award-winning um, book. That's the Newbery Medal that you can see on the front cover. It was made into a film. And there is a surprising theme in English literature. Who's read Danny the Champion of the World? The young boy who steals pheasants from the neighboring landowner? He's a poacher too. The, one of the most famous books in the English language, the oldest book, one of the oldest books in the English language, made into countless films. And, 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 and children's books as well. Can anybody name this? Features a poacher. You all know this book. Even if I'm talking to mostly South African audience, you know this book about this English poacher. Yeah? Does anybody not know of Robin Hood? And these characteristics of all these poachers, all, all of whom are heroes, the common characteristic, please, which you can't see in this image of Robin Hood, what do they all share? They're white men. Thank you, Jared. <laughs> Trust you to spot that. Yes, the poachers who we, we worship and, and, and celebrate are, are white men in children's literature. So where are the people of color who are poachers and who are heroes in children's literature that, that you know of? I, I speak from a, a British perspective. I know the British literature well. In South Africa, do we have any? Anywhere in the world? You see, in English literature, I see books like this, which feature white heroes savoring African wildlife, um, or, or, or white saviors coming into African game reserves, or um, white Tarzan figures being brought up on, in, in, on Zimbabwean farms, 
um, where we celebrate um, white people's connection to, to African landscape. This creates a systemic injustice which children reading books as nine to ten-year-olds can't do much about. They cannot seek that, that epistemic virtue themselves um, because they're nine and ten, and yet their role models are being, being um, forged in the, at a very early age. So why does this matter? Because, um, as you will probably have heard, and how much time have I got, Libby? Another... Thank you, Karis, thank you. Um, in, in December last year, the com uh, Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity met and agreed Target 3, um, which, in, in this text-heavy slide, let me pull out the, the crucial bits in, in yellow, was to set up 30% uh, of territories, lands and seas, to be um, protected through protected areas or other effective area-based conservation measures where sustainable use was to be allowed if it is compatible with conservation measures. And they made sure twice, you can see in green, to recognize that um, indigenous and rural communities' rights would be protected and respected. We've got 17% of the world in protected areas just now. Where's that other 13% going to come from? Where should it come from? How do we know what places need protecting most? Um, how do we know where it would be cheapest to work? This is the area of intense dispute. And this, this 30 by 30 clause, because they want to protect 30% of the world by 2030, caused a great deal of, of fight and controversy. You have people like um, National Geographic and the WISC Campaign for Nature pushing for the 30 by 30 target, and organizations like Cultural Survival and Survival International campaigning against it. They were cause, calling it the, the, the largest land grab in history. And we can see why the battles are being fought um, and why conservation data matter, because in order to determine where these conservation areas should be set aside, you need large amounts of data. You need data showing you where the species are found, where, where habitat is found, how these habitats are changing, how they will change through climate change, how they're being used by different farmer groups and, and pastoral groups and fisher people, and what, what are the costs of trying to impl implement conservation in the area, which you can begin to estimate by looking at land prices, and you get land prices from large data sets. I've seen um, papers that were released into the public domain which suggested that through modeling that it would be possible to, for all farming, all herding, and all fishing to cease in the new protected areas, in 13% of the world's territories, in the next 10 years, and for these people to take up tourism, and for this to, do, to be a profitable, a, 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 an economically just transition, a just alternative. The data and the modeling which produced that result need a lot of scrutiny, because that's bananas, it's wrong. And yet this was publicly circulated by um, some prestigious and, and well-recognized scientists. How the, can the data go wrong? Well, um, take Simon Lewis's um, misfortunate article in Nature a couple of years ago where he was ad advocating against planting plantations, but for good reason, and instead wanted natural forests. Well, what do you mean by natural forests? Those which develop with little or no disturbance from humans. You can take a flawed but very simple map of where people are and overlap them with forests and discover there are hundreds of millions of people living in forests which need to be restored to anything but naturalness as defined here. Or to take a, a better example of how the data can go wrong, I want to, to take you to Mount Hanang in, in Tanzania, which is an area I know quite well because my partner was born in the village Nangwa. And you can see on the ridge these small um, Dots of the people, those are my um, nephews and nieces and, and, and daughters. And Mount Hanang is tall, as you can see from this mount picture. It's three and a half thousand meters. And I want us all to agree, please, that Mount Hanang is in very little danger of being flooded. Not since Noah has that place been underwater. It's ericaceous montane vegetation. But in the WWF's eco-region map, 
of the world, which identifies where the world's habitat is and wh which parts of it therefore need to be con conserved in order to get a representative picture of different uh, habitats. This montane ericaceous vegetation appears, in fact, as a flooded grassland. They think it looks like the picture on the right with the flamingos and the lake and the giraffe. Um, the blue patch that you can see over Mount Tanang is um, this African, East African halophytic grassland. They've got it completely wrong. And the authors of the map who gets it right were also authors of the map who got it wrong. And when I wrote to them to say, how did you do this? They said, just wait, because we're publishing ourselves a critique of the process which turns accurate or reasonably accurate vegetation maps into rather fantastical um, maps of, of, um, of different habitat. Two minutes, Karis? Three? Two minutes, okay. So, conservation data justice is a, a, a new field, and it's a tremendous privilege to be um, working with a, 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 just a number of scholars um, who are also focusing on the ways in which data, and not, not can just be wrong, but, but can be systematically biased in ways which um, will cause people and, and nature disadvantage. There is a map which came out um, in, in nature of um, restoration activity, and they uh, wanted to work out where the best places to, to restore wild nature were. And to do so, they um, took a maps of the distribution of, of wildlife and biodiversity all around the planet, and um, decided that the, the best place to restore wild nature were in the places where you already had wild habitat, where you had bushland, grassland, forest land, dry lands, marshlands, but where there was um, a, a human present, where there was urban areas, and where there was farmland and pasture, no wildlife were present. And there's a, a reasoning there, because it's more expensive to restore land which is heavily altered. But your map of biodiversity makes it impossible for biodiversity to be, to be present in urban areas or, or farmland. Now, those same maps of biodiversity were then used in the Species Threat Assessment Reduction Index, which sought to work out ways in which you can reduce the threat to wildlife. But the map they used of where the wildlife was made sure there was no wildlife in agricultural areas. Therefore, wildlife are not threatened in agricultural areas because they aren't there in the first place. So the way, in, so, so, so we're not just talking about bias and threat to um, people, it's bias and threat to nature, which is systematically introduced through um, data in ways which we're only just beginning to recognize. Thank you very much for listening, folks. I'm out of time. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Vanessa Masterson, and today I'm going to talk to you about silverbacks, black mambas, and deadly women, changing gender identities and narratives of place in conservation. So today I'm here representing uh, our project team who couldn't be here, Simon and Laura Bethia. Um, and this is a project that we have just started. So like Libby and uh, Dan, I'm very open to lots and lots of feedback. Um, I work at the Stockholm Resilience Center, and I have worked largely in the interdisciplinary social ecological systems space. So I feel a little bit like a spy in the uh, political ecology space, but I'm really looking forward to, uh, to learning from you all and getting some feedback. So first today, I'm going to present on the background and the aims of our new project. And then to just give you a bit of a flavor of what we're talking about, I'll present a pilot study which is results from Laura Bethia's master's thesis, um, which she undertook in South Africa. And then I'll end off by describing the next steps in our project and what we're gonna do in the future. So in many places in the global south, biodiversity conservation has conventionally been viewed as this very alpha male or silverback kind of activity. It's a settler colonial activity shaped by notions of big game hunting and the exclusion of black and indigenous peoples from their ancestral lands. Um, these identities persist today and influence conservation practices, for example, the recent militarized efforts to control rhino poaching. But, and I don't have to tell this room this, this is changing. 
Um, there is a global movement which aims to diversify and transform conservation, uh, to, diverse, uh, sorry, to decolonize, um, and that sees gender diversity and inclusivity as critical for ecosystem stewardship. So gender mainstreaming um, programs have brought more women into conservation and increased their prominence. Um, and so we have these new identities that are emerging. We now have these silverbacks uh, working alongside all women anti-poaching units, such as the Black Mambas, who work on the Balule Park in the Lowveld, and indigenous women ranger groups in the Northern Australia. But these initiatives are really situated within existing masculinist structures and ideologies. There's also been little empirical research on the lived experiences, motivations, and practices of conservationists who are involved in these big shifts. So that brings us to our broad project. We aim to explore the interaction between gender identities and conservation practices. We've chosen two iconic biodiversity spots um, in the world, the, the greater Kruger area or the Lowveld. Um, and top end Australia, and we've chosen them because they share uh, savannah ecosystem features, but also historical associations with these masculinist um, identities and race-based discrimination. So I'm going to quickly take you through a little bit of the kind of conceptual background that we're working with here. Um, it might be a little bit too quick to be useful, but bear with me. Um, the, the first kind of um, body of literature that we're looking at is around transforming conservation. So we want to draw on, on multiple uses of transformation from the social ecological to the racial and to institutional transformation. And from all of these we recognize the need to diversify, decolonize and dismantle inequitable power relations. We also, these also recognize that we need to really address deep-seated beliefs and norms and nurture reflexivity around those norms. Secondly, we are really interested in drawing on critical social science on conservation practice rather than for conservation practice. Um, and the commitment that this literature has to explore experiences, motivations, and perspectives of conservation professionals themselves. And we're hoping here to kind of uh, speak into the literature that's trying to show the, the usefulness of interpretive and particip participatory approaches uh, from the social sciences to conservation practice. Thirdly, uh, to understand the motivations of caring and stewarding biodiversity, we view sense of place as a tool to sort of surface the meanings uh, that the landscape holds for conservationists and some of their motivation. And then fourth, um, we're going to be drawing on performative uh, and intersectional gender identities uh, and the, the vast work on that. Um, we will be looking at gender identities as socially constructed um, with a performative approach, socially constructed against, sorry, across contexts and through time. And then of course, um, acknowledging that gender identities are intersectional and they're closely related to race, class, language, and other axes of difference and, um, and the power relations involved there. <coughs> okay, so now I'm going to zoom in to this pilot study that Laura Bethia engaged in in, in 2021. Um, she asked the question, how do place meanings inform women's conservation practices in the Lowveld? And how do women conservationists navigate this traditionally male-dominated conservation um, area? All of the photos that I'm going to show now are from the photo voice exercises that she uh, engaged with. So they are the participants' photos, but the names have been changed. So just to quickly tell you, uh, Laura Bethia used uh, qualitative in-depth interviews and participatory photography to, uh, to interview uh, and engage with 18 stakeholders, uh, all women in the Lowveld. She did this through the pandemic, so she, she engaged in photo voice through the pandemic on Zoom, which was not easy but actually worked very well. So if anyone's interested in talking about some more about online methods, I'm, I'm around. Um, and 
we drew very heavily here on, on this uh, methodology around photo voice, which draws on Freire's critical consciousness and feminist theory. Um, and what's happening here is that participants are using their own photographs to reflect on their experiences. So they are the experts of their own lives and co-producing the science with us. So some insights from uh, Laura Bethia's work. Participants' narratives revealed a shared reverence for the low felt, commonly articulated as the, the Kruger Park is the mecca of conservation, or it's the epicenter of biodiversity. <clears throat> uh, place meetings were also associated with a sense of belonging and a sense of awe. Um, and really, regardless of the participants' different values, histories, and ties to the region, their place meanings revealed how notions of care underlie their motivation to practice conservation. Some participants also emphasized this deep emotional attachment associated with kinship ties um, and the desire to practice reciprocity in their home communities. As Lissedi says here, because it's where I come from and it's my people, it's my landscape. Interestingly, notions of care also emerge from negative place experiences. So for instance, lots of the participants articulated negative perceptions of high game fences. Um, to them, that was representative of, of exclusionary conditions of apartheid and the fragmentation of landscapes. And so as a result, participants prioritized efforts to restore community relations and expanding conservation beyond the fence. So to the second question, how do women conservationists navigate these spaces? Um, well, first of all, women uh, and the participants unanimously view the low felt landscape as heavily male driven, um, and they face several forms of discrimination, including assumed incapability, lack of knowledge, uh, cultural expectations to make sacrifices for family, social harassment, intimidation, and racial discrimination, among others. So in this context, the hegemonic masculinity and militaristic practices of conservation are shaping the social norms and expectations of gender roles. So how do uh, these women view and perceive uh, the current gender roles? Well, um, collectively, they view normative masculinities as encompassing authoritativeness, aggression, toughness, callousness, uh, performances of military bravado. And normative femininities are seen as subservience, biological vulnerability, caregiving, uh, nurturing, empathy, bridging roles. So for these women, when they're facing these challenges of, of hegemonic masculinity and subjugation, um, they described having to, to really develop coping strategies in order to be taken seriously um, and to, to claim space in conservation. <clears throat> so we, we identified kind of three main negotiations going on here. <laughs> um, so what, what's happening here is that participants tend to, to have to navigate between demonstrating a proficiency in the practices that are traditionally masculine on the left-hand side, for example, physical toughness, public assertiveness, or adopting these paramilitarized approaches, and they have to navigate between that and emphasizing the necessity of approaches that are reflective of these normative femininities, um, demonstrating emotional responsiveness, for example, or working quietly behind the scenes, or developing inclusive approaches. So really importantly here, participants' narratives show that while they perform some of these masculinities, and that allows more women to be part of conservation, um, but by doing that, they're also reinforcing these gender binaries and the dominance of masculinities. So what are the impl uh, implications of this for conservation? Uh, so women in this study all highlighted the need to extend conservation beyond the fence um, by building relationships with communities, fostering communication, and performing these bridging roles. And so by, directing, by redirecting all the attention that's given to wildlife, crime, and poaching 
um, and prioritizing these transboundary relationships, women are then contributing to, uh, to interrupting this quite entrenched, militarized approach to conservation. But of course, uh, the normative expectations uh, of women's roles in these spaces are imposing barriers for them to really do their jobs and to make things more inclusive. So it shows um, essentially that gender balance is not achieved by integrating women into existing structures, uh, but we really need to question the practices that are reinforcing these gender binaries. So for my last slide, I'm gonna zoom out again. So, um, and now we're talking about the broad project um, that we've just started this year. We have funding from uh, the Swedish fund of FORMAS um, for four years. Um, and what we're going to be doing is expanding the project, not just looking at South Africa, uh, but also uh, looking at top end, a region in Australia I've never been to, but I'm looking forward to it. Simon knows all about it. Um, and essentially, after Laura Bethia's work, we realized that, uh, of course, gender cannot be studied only as a woman's issue in conservation. So um, a lot of the participants told us that, that they want to know what men and people who identify as other genders think and, and how they kind of relate to these discourses. So we're going to be uh, expanding our work and using photo voice again to, um, to engage with uh, conservation practitioners of all genders. Um, Oh yes, there we go. And then we're also really interested in how are these gender identities constructed in the broader discourses, in the media um, and national print that talks about issues of conservation, how are women and men and gender identities um, constructed and represented? So we'll use critical discourse for that. And then lastly, we aim to build a bit of a community of practice with our uh, steering group and our uh, reference group and whoever is interested, of course, uh, and explore the implications of our data and the insights uh, and to sort of produce a synthesis. And then what we'd like to do with the help of our participants is, make, is use their photographs um, to produce an online exhibition and really uh, get the reflections and the conversation started more broadly in the public. So thank you very much for listening. I would love to hear your feedback on our upcoming work and I look forward to connecting with your work too. Thanks.